Okay. Um, we will perhaps then uh, find another solution uh, for those who, so anybody who, who is like, like this, can you send me an email? Because if there are a few students, then the easiest way to handle it is to just have another alternate session where I would say, okay, you can come to the office at that time as well, and we would be able to answer questions. So anybody who cannot attend the office hours uh, as scheduled, just let me know by email, and then we can handle it. Yeah. All right. Let's begin. Um, yes, welcome everyone to the either the last or the second last lecture of my quantum thermodynamics part. It is unclear whether Lydia will begin tomorrow or I will continue. It depends on how much I get done in this lecture. But in any case, the focus of um, the remaining part for me in quantum thermo is autonomous thermal machines. And the goal uh, for this lecture is at the end to understand sort of all of the details of the little schematic that I've drawn. What I have drawn is the simplest example of a quantum refrigerator. So this is actually a um, Okay, so just before before I begin, let me sort of discuss why we would like to study autonomous quantum machines. So, so far in the course, everything that I've done has involved discrete operations. So when we began the course, we first did a bit of, well, static thermodynamics, where we just talked about the properties of a state and temperature and virtual temperature. And then the first operation that we did was the qubit swap, on which we based this entire erasure protocol and all of the generalizations that we did in the last lecture. Now, the problem with the discrete operation is it's, I mean, we treat it as instantaneous. We start with the state rho, we perform some unitary operation, and immediately we have now the unitary operation on rho. But if we were to implement this in a laboratory, well, we have to do it by actually turning on and turning off a Hamiltonian. So the classic example is, if I want a qubit to go from the state plus to minus, so if I'm trying to, let me draw a line here. So as an example of a discrete operation, I can try and get this qubit plus state to go to the qubit minus state. And the easiest way to do this, one of the ways to do this is to rotate from plus to minus in the, in the block sphere, so precession. So I can do, use a Hamiltonian H is equal to some gamma times B, um, or actually maybe the easiest way to B sigma Z, so where B is the strength of the magnetic field and sigma Z is a Pauli operator. And I know what this is going to do in the block sphere. So this is now um, H. And what it's going to do is it's going to rotate around the block sphere. So if I start with plus here, and this is the state minus, then eventually I know that for a well-chosen time, I'm going to have that e to the minus i h t on plus is equal to minus for some, so for t equals to, well, it's going to be proportional to 1 over b, so something like pi over b with some constants. There's also h bar and stuff when you add units. but Effectively, I know I can do this, but the important point here is that in order to do this unitary operation, if I think about the evolution of the system, what I'm going to have is, so if this is rho, and this is the t-axis, then at some point t is equal to t naught, I'm going to turn on the Hamiltonian. So, so I'm going to turn on, on h, and I'm going to call this h interaction now, so that it's... Uh, clear that it's the interaction Hamiltonian, and then at some t is equal to t final, I'm going to turn it off. And I have to control t final minus t naught particularly because t final minus t naught is exactly this delta t that um, has to be chosen precisely. Okay, so now if we have this picture in our mind and we think of, well, let's think of the erasure protocol. What did I have? I have a qubit system and then I take a sequence of qubits from the bath, and I swap my system with each of these qubits one by one. So actually, when you think about it, it involves a huge amount of control. For every swap, I need to do this procedure. I have to turn on and turn off an interaction Hamiltonian. And also, the arrangement has, cannot be static, because I have to take the system and first interact with one qubit, then another qubit, then the third qubit, and so on and so forth. So in fact, this is a very complicated operation if you think about it. And also, when you try and saturate Landau's principle, as we discussed last time, then you have the steps increasing more and more. And 
asymptotically to become unbounded. So the whole purpose of doing autonomous thermal machines is to actually get rid of all of that and say, instead of having a machine where we have to keep on having many steps repeated one after the other with a high degree of control, instead we have a machine that we design the interaction in such a way that once we turn it on, it runs indefinitely. And we do not need to interfere with it anymore, and it does what we want. Now, this is not a quantum idea. Um, classical machines, hi Marco, um, are very much of this form. Um, a, a car engine is, is actually a typical example. You, you turn the ignition once, and once you've turned the ignition on, the engine will run indefinitely as long as, uh, one, the fuel does not run out, and second, the driver doesn't do something weird with the clutch and the gears. Um, and the important part about the car engine is what it does is it's not only doing the work that you want, which is turning the wheels, but part of the energy that the, the engine is using up also goes into maintaining the cycle. So the engine itself, which is this motion of the piston, that motion of the piston is a cycle of the engine and it's maintained by the consumption of fuel itself. So this is something what, this is what we want to mimic with autonomous thermal machines. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start with the classic example of refrigeration. And what do I need in refrigeration? So what does refrigeration mean? Refrigeration is essentially the following process, and I'm going to do it for the simplest case of a single qubit. So I have a qubit, and its energy is, I'm going to call it EC. I've labeled it C because it's my cold qubit. It may or may not be connected to a thermal bath that's at some cold temperature. Now, if it's connected to a thermal bath, then I define refrigeration very simply. I need to have this qubit be even colder than its thermal bath. So for example, I have my refrigerator, and it is exposed to the environment around it, but I want it to remain the internal part of the refrigerator. I want it to remain even colder than the environment it's connected to. So I need to get this um, temperature to be smaller than actually beta C. Okay. Now, um, how do I do this? Well, we can use what we had in the, in the virtual qubits part. The simplest way to do this would be to connect it to another qubit of the same energy, with uh, so EC, with beta uh, star, or beta, well, let's call it beta virtual, which is greater than beta C. So I know that if I connected two virtual qubits and I do a swap, sorry, two, if I, know, I know if I connect two real qubits and I do a swap between them, then I will simply get the virtual qubit of one to be on the other one. So the easiest way to cool this would be simply to connect it to a, a qubit whose virtual temperature is greater than the one I, I have on this side. Remember that greater virtual, um, greater beta means colder, smaller beta means hotter. Okay, and also we discussed how we could actually do this. This we could mimic by going, well, the way to get this would be to say, let me have a, a, a virtual qubit in a bigger system, and this is exactly what I've, I've drawn on the other side. So I have two qubits now, okay? And the two qubits have the properties, so this is now ER, and this is EH. And the two qubits have the property that ER minus EH is equal to EC. And why is this the case? This is the case because if now I consider the joint system between these two, then I get, so this whole thing is uh, this way. This gives me a system where it's not exactly up to scale, but this is now ER, this is EH, and this is the joint system. So if I call R and H, this is now 0, 0. This is the state 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And what we see is that my intermediate two states here are a virtual qubit that I could couple to EC, and it has the same energy. Okay. So now I know how to consider to make a virtual qubit couple to that. And the final thing is now, well, I need to have that the virtual temperature here is greater than beta C. So how do I do this? One of the um, important ways to think about thermal machines is you, you can actually think about it in the, in the classical case. What does a fridge do? A fridge has some heat or work source, and it has some cold system where you want to draw energy out of, and it has some sink at room temperature or environment temperature that you want to put it in. So you see that the energy flow is you take stuff from the cold and from the hot and you put it together in R, right? So 
very clearly, if, you, if I now design an interaction between CR and H that has this form, you clearly see that ER has to be equal to the sum of EC and EH, simply because I'm taking from the cold and hot and the sum of it is going to R. So that, that's the reason why I've drawn the large one to be R and the smaller one to be H. This already guarantees that when I construct my virtual qubit, it's going to move in the direction of a fridge. If I'd done the opposite, which is in the case of the engine, where I, I want to draw from a heat source and dump it into, on the one hand, get work, and on the other hand, put stuff in the environment, because this is how an engine works, then you would see, ah, actually my hot um, system has to actually have the energy to be the sum of the other two. Okay, so in this case I say, as I've drawn actually in this case, in the figure here, my room temperature qubit, which I've designated by R, is connected to some beta R, my hot qubit is connected to some beta hot, and they have, the, of course, the, the relationship that beta hot is less than beta R is less than beta C, so hot, room, and cold. Okay, what am I going to get here? Well, I can calculate the virtual temperature. This is something that has been done a long time ago in the, in the lecture. So what is the virtual temperature of this one? Beta V. I calculated the usual way, E to the minus beta V times that energy gap. Now it is E10 minus E01, but I've already chosen it so that ER minus EH is EC, so this is now EC. What is this equal to? It's equal to... Um, the ratio between this population and this population, so it's P10 upon P01, and this is both on the room and the hot, and this is e to the minus beta RER um, times e to the plus beta hot, E hot, okay, and this is going to give me that beta V is equal to beta R E R minus beta hot E hot upon E C. And an even nicer way to, uh, to put this, I know that E R is equal to E H plus E C, so I can write this as beta R plus, uh, so I split E R into I split this into EC plus E hot so that I can take EC outside and then I get plus E hot upon EC beta R minus beta H. The reason I put it in this form is because you can see clearly what's happening. My beta virtual is equal to beta R plus something. So EH by EC is a positive number um, which the lowest value is zero if EH goes to zero. And then beta R by beta H is also a positive number because beta R is greater than beta hot. So what this does is it enables you to get a virtual temperature that's smaller than beta R. Now, that does not guarantee that's smaller than beta C, but you can also see something else here. One, the only condition I've put on this in order to make the, the interaction, and this I will discuss shortly, energy preserving, is to have that the sum of EC and EH is ER but there's still one degree of freedom. I can keep the difference between these two energies equal to EC while pushing both of them up or down, which means that I can essentially, EH is my degree of freedom still, and the higher I make EH, leaving the temperatures the same, the greater this value can become. So this value essentially, this virtual temperature, the lowest value is beta R, but the highest value is infinity. I can get it to be as cold as I like. So for any beta C that I pick, I can always pick an energy that's high enough such that beta V is greater than beta C when I have, when I have my condition for refrigeration. Okay, is there any question? All right, so um, now, as we discussed in the lecture on the qubit swap, I could proceed now with this schematic that I've drawn, I could proceed in the following way. I start with these three qubits, each of them is connected to the environment, so the initial state of them. So, so the initial state, initial row, would just be tau C, tensor tau room, tensor tau hot, and I use tau, as in tau x is e to the minus beta um, hx, upon Zx, so it's just the thermal state of that Hamiltonian, okay? And then I can do a swap, so. 
Now, I will get some rho CRH that is correlated. And the reason is the swap is now not a, well, it's, it's clearly not a full qubit swap. You have three qubits. It's a swap between C and that subspace. And what is this swap between which two states? This is important here. The swap is, um, oh, let's put it in another color. This swap is between the states 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0. So this is the reason in the schematic I've drawn the arrows the way I did. Essentially, the transition that we like, the one that cools, is the one that I've written in blue. It's the one that the room temperature qubit goes from the ground to the excited state. And as a result, the cold and the hot qubits go from the excited to the ground state. The opposite one, of course, is the one where, um, well, the, the reverse transition is where the room temperature qubit actually gives energy to the cold and hot. But in any case, the two states that switch in this transition and the reverse transition are the two states 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0. If I don't write it, it's always, um, always assumed that I've used the, the ordering C, R, and then H. Okay. Okay. So, um, right. So what I can do is I can do this swap, and you have calculated using the property of swapping with a real and virtual qubit that when I do this swap, the temperature of the cold qubit will go towards the, temp the virtual temperature. It will not go instantly there because it's, you're swapping with the virtual qubit, so there's not full norm in that subspace. But you will go somewhere in between. And so the way we would then get closer and closer to the virtual temperature would be, well, you swap, then you reset the virtual qubit. So then here, you can reset the virtual qubit. Now, what does the reset do? The easiest way to reset the virtual qubit, which is a composite qubit of room and hot, is just to reset both the room and hot qubits. And the reset operation now is going to take you to, so I'm going to, sorry, let me call this rho prime of CRH. So it's the second state. And so the reset operation, which we've already discussed, Sorry. is going to trace out the room and the hot qubits. and put back the thermal states of that, right? OK. And then I can repeat this operation, so on and so forth. And then the cold system will approach the, the temperature of the virtual qubit. What I haven't done here is actually I haven't accounted for the interaction of the cold system with its own environment, right? Because if it resets to its temperature in between all of this, then it basically you're starting again. So already you see some a problem with looking at discrete operations here. What you would like to do in such a scenario is actually compete between the interaction of C with its own environment and the rate at which this process is happening, where you're swapping with the virtual qubit and resetting. Because this process is helping you cool, whereas, whereas the interaction with its environment is returning it back to the temperature of the environment. So there are two competing processes. So you already see, well, the only way to compare them is to have some sort of rate for each of them. And discrete operation doesn't show this. OK, so this is what we're going to do now. We are going to turn all of these operations autonomous, or rather continuous, in the first place. Uh, OK, so how do we turn this autonomous? There are two parts to the, to the operation. One is a swap, one is a reset. So first, let's do it with the swap. OK, what is the swap unitary? Well, the swap u is just equal to 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, plus the Hermitian conjugate, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, plus identity on the rest. So if you remember, it's, it's basically as a density matrix. It has a 1, 1, 0, 0 in the subspace that we want, and then it's 1 in the rest. OK, okay. In, in principle, this is a, we, we could really write it as this matrix, because there are exactly eight elements. Since there are three qubits, there are eight basis states, and you're really swapping in the 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 subspace. I've not written it in, in a very computationally ordered way, but that's how it looks. And so the easiest way to turn this into a Hamiltonian um, interaction, a continuous interaction, so the Hamiltonian, you just have to have something like 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, plus 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and that's it. So equals to 
Let's call this g times this. Now, what have I done? I've used the fact that this term is basically equal to e to the minus i h t for some t, where h is of the form, if I use the same density matrix notation, it's just zeros in the places where there were ones. And in the place that there were ones, you just need to choose something in these in the um, in the x or the y basis because you want this is the thing that switches between in the z basis. So you just have to choose something in the x or y basis. So I've used this this one, but I could also use alternatively the y operator. So I could have used zero minus i i zero, and this would have done the same thing, basically. So it's I'm using the fact that when the unitary is a switch between the z, um, the z elements. I can do this by rotating around x. I can also do this by rotating around y. So in the block sphere, if I want to rotate the north pole to the south pole or vice versa, I can rotate around the x of the block sphere, or I can rotate around the y of the block sphere, or I can rotate around anything in, that, in the equator, so like that. It just so happens that the, the one that's used in the literature most often is, is just this one, so I've used this one. OK. so. What I've done is I've replaced, so, so I've replaced u rho u dagger has now become d rho by dt is equal to minus i h comma rho. Let's call this h int, where h int is this one. And I know that if I do this evolution, then at some point it will actually implement the unitary. But of course, if this is the only thing that's happening, it's just going to cycle as to having done the unitary, then return to the initial state, and so on and so forth. Okay? This, by the way, d rho by dt is minus i h comma rho is just the Schrodinger equation for density matrices. This is not what you're used to. Okay. And so now the next thing is the reset. How do I turn the reset into a continuous operation? Um, the easiest way is to turn this instantaneous, very discrete operation into a differential thing. So one way I can do it is I can say, well, instead of it just going from the state to the reset state, I consider that in every small unit of time, there is a probability that this happens. So what I say is that rho at t, so if I evolve it for dt, there's going to be some probability. And here I put in a rate. So my rate is going to be, let's choose it to be gamma. So with the probability gamma dt, I'm going to go to my reset state tau. And with the remaining probability, 1 minus gamma dt, I'm going to stay rho t. This is now a continuous operation. Per unit time, there's a probability that something happens. Okay? And this is going to be, this is now going to give me a very simple differential equation. So d rho by dt, which remember is, is defined as rho of, let's say, t plus dt, which is on the right hand side minus rho of, tt, uh, rho of t upon dt is equal to gamma times minus gamma times rho minus tau. I think this is tau minus rho. This minus this upon dt is mm, gamma tau minus rho. Have I done this correctly? If tau is greater than rho, then you should have, that is positive, sorry. There is no point in sign there. <laughs> yes. OK, great. Um, yes, so what is the effect of, of this one here? So this is actually a very, very simple differential equation. The solution to this has the same form if rho was not a density matrix, but really just, um, just a, a variable. So the if I have dx by dt is equal to gamma, and let's say, a minus x, then the solution of this is that xt is equal to a plus e to the minus gamma t x minus a. And so what you see is that at t is equal to 0, you have that x0 is, is basically, well, oh, sorry, here's x0. At t is equal to 0, this is 1, so you get a plus x0 minus a, so x0 is x0 as, as it's supposed to be. At t is equal to infinity, gamma, this term vanishes, and so you just get that x infinity is equal to a. And in between, if I was to plot this, 
this was x t, this was t, and if this is a, and this is x zero, I'm going to get an exponential decay to that state. So this is called sometimes exponential decay, sometimes it's called this, the process of relaxation, so it relaxes into the thermal state. Okay, um, important to note when, when you look at, if, I t if rho, for example, is a density matrix of a qubit, and tau is a thermal state, so then I know in the energy eigenbasis tau will be diagonal, but rho can be anything, for example, to start off with, then you see what that does. Because the thermal state has zero diagonal elements, it, uh, zero, sorry, zero off-diagonal elements, it means that whatever you start with, all of the off-diagonal elements will sort of decay to zero, whereas the on-diagonal elements would, of course, relax to the values that they have in, in tau in the thermal state. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave that. I'm going to go to the next slide. All right. Okay, so now that I have those ingredients, I'm going to write down an equation with them. So I'm going to simply add them. I'm going to say d rho by dt is equal to minus i h int plus h naught comma rho. And I'm going to explain this. Plus, and now I have that. So, aha. Okay, sorry, I should just complete this. So it, this is, of course, the reset equation when I just have a single, um, a single state. But we also know that the reset works when I have joint states. All I have to do is trace out and then reset just the part that I'm, just the system in which I'm actually doing the reset operations. So this has an equivalent thing here. It's, um, so if I say, let's, let's call this the dx, dx of rho, and this is the, we call it the dissipator, or let's, no, here let's just say reset. So the reset of the x state, so x can be cold, it can be room, it can be hot, but it's one of them. Then what I do is I take, um, again, it's gamma, tau, x, tensored trace over x of rho minus rho. So it's the same principle as, as this one. It's just that now I, I'm ensuring that I'm doing the reset only on the x part. And this is also gamma x because each of the rates can be different. So in, that case, in, in the case that I'm resetting x, I trace away x, I put back the thermal state. And that's, and that's where the thing comes from. So I can do the same um, analysis there. And Essentially here as well, I'm going to get that rho t is going to give be tau x tensor trace over x of rho plus e to the minus gamma x t times um, yeah rho minus tau x tensor trace over x rho. Okay, okay. so. Now that I have those two things, yes, so I can now write down the equation for this. This is going to be the sum x in C, R, and H. And here I have um, gamma x times tau x tensor trace x rho minus Okay, so what have I done? So first of all, the H naught is the local, the, so that's the local energies, you can call them. This is just, remember that there are three qubits and each of them have their own Hamiltonian. So H naught is equal to, for instance, I would write HC um, tensor identity RH plus, and then there's the, um, the R and the H terms. And of course, HC itself is just EC1, 1, 1 on C. So these are just the local Hamiltonians. Okay. Now, the, one of the things that I've done in the construction so far 
and I haven't discussed it yet, is the fact that all of the things, the interactions I've chosen, are sort of energy preserving. So first of all, the, by choosing ER to be the sum of EC and EH, what I've ensured is that those two states, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0, have the same energy. So that's why I can describe it as the room temperature qubit gives its energy to the hot qubit and the, and the, and the cold qubit together. Um, the other thing that is not so immediate to show is that the dissipator is also, because it's an incoherent operation, it only acts in the, it only acts to create the thermal state, which is incoherent in the energy eigenbasis. It also has a property that you can switch, it commutes if you say, you can switch it with H naught in the sense, in the following sense. So one could consider the following, I can evolve rho via H naught for T1, then I can evolve rho via H uh, int for T2, and rho, and then, so rho, rho prime, rho double prime. I can evolve it under dx, for example, for T3, and so on and so forth. And the point is that these are interchangeable. So, I, sorry, H naught, the important part is that H naught is interchangeable with these. So H int is not, but H naught is. So I'm, I'm not, I cannot do what I do in um, normal thermodynamics. I've, if, if I don't have dissipators and I just have Hamiltonians, I would write this as e to the i h naught t1, e to the i h int t2, for example. But h naught and h int already, we know that they commute because they have the same energy. So I know that I can put in h naught in any order with h int. But I can also do the same thing with dx. And this is something that I'm not going to prove here, but you can do this. And the result of this, this um, argument is that, in fact, it is not really necessary to include H naught here, because what I can do is I can evolve it under just H int and the dissipator, and then I can put in H naught at the end to find out what my phases were. So if I evolve this for a T1, I can evolve it under the sum of just H int and the dissipators for the T1, and then at the end I can just put on, I can first evolve rho under just H int and the dissipators, and I get a rho prime, and then my rho final is actually equal to rho prime e to the minus i, so let's say t1, e to the minus i h naught t1, e to the plus i h naught t1. So in fact, in most Limbladians, I don't actually have to consider this. Okay, this, this um, the way of, uh, the mathematical expression for this is to say I've gone into a rotating frame. So H naught is basically just a rotation of all of the three qubit states. And if I go into the rotating frame, I see what I have without the rotation, and then I can just apply the rotation at the end. That's what is happening here. Okay. So in this equation, I do not really have to put um, H naught in. Right? Now, um, some terminology. This is what we call a master equation. Um, and the two parts of it, so it's important to know that this part, the commutator part, is the local evolution. So it depends just on the internal dynamics of the system. As you see, the only two terms that appear there are the local energies of the system and the interaction Hamiltonian, but the interaction Hamiltonian is an internal one. It's within these three qubits. But the other part of this, this is the environment part. So it's induced by an environment. Um, right, and in this second part of the lecture, or perhaps in tomorrow's lecture, I'm not sure, we will discuss the master equation a bit more detail because in order to write down such an equation, there are a number of assumptions and subtleties that go into it to make sure that it's actually a valid equation. So for instance, what I did in the first step was to derive individually continuous versions of various operations, and then I said, well, let me just add them all together. But this is not always possible. Here, because the operations are simple, I was able to add them together, but in general, if you add, for example, if you try to add two non-commuting operations or two operations that are, have non-locality and work between different components in an arbitrary manner, you will actually get an answer that's not the same as, uh, as what you were trying to get or something that does not actually work because it involves non-commuting currents within the system. So one has to be careful, and we will discuss a bit more about these um, Hamiltonians, but this, at the end of it, the goal is to really get such a master equation. It also is important as to what the assumptions in the environment are. And that is something we will also discuss in the second part of the lecture. 
speaking of which, I have to end at 10, 10.30. Yes, I should remember 10.30, but 11.20. All right, are there any questions? Yes? To explain the reset operator. Ah, the DX. The dissipator. The dissipator. Aha. So, so to recap, what I did is I, I started with the discrete reset operation, which takes my state to the thermal state. Um, and then I turned it into a continuous operation by making it a differential process. I go in a dt unit of time. There is a small probability given by the rate times dt of becoming my thermal state. The rest, not. Now, this here, I didn't, I didn't call this explicitly. So this down here is rho t plus dt. And this is now rho t. So I can convert this into a differential equation by just using the, prop, the definition of the differential. It's rho t plus dt minus rho t by dt. And so then it's just a bit of arithmetic to get this equation here. So d rho by dt is, is gamma times that. And the only difference between this one and, and that one is that I just said, well, actually, rho itself might be a reduced state of a bigger system. So I could have had rho A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but I'm only resetting one of them, like I'm resetting system B, for example. So that was, that was this equation here. It's, it's exactly the same there. But what I've done is I've said, when I reset, so you can look at it as this form. The differential equation just basically has the state you're going to minus the state you are. That's, that's, the reset, that's the core of the reset. And here, the state I'm going to is not the thermal state on everything. It's the thermal state only on the system that I am resetting tensored the same thing on the rest, minus the state. So like what, one example would be just, I would say gamma cold, tau cold tensor, trace over the cold one of rho cold rh minus rho cold room hot. So this is an example if I put x equals to c. Yeah. Ah, um, sorry. No, so I, I'm just, I'm just, I've just used this as a notation as like dx to be the dissipator on x. Yeah, d is not, d is not the differential on rho. Yes, sorry, I, 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 I didn't think of that. You, yeah, it's not, it's d is not meant to be. I just wanted to use some notation on it, so I just call d to be the dissipator. On, on this one here, I mean, I so all of this was. I mean, I could have called this any any letter; it didn't matter. I yeah, I just used D as a dissipator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there any differential equation involving dissipator? Um. Yes. Aha! Uh -huh. But you act only on the thing. I, well, I would still, well, I would do, so here the, the generalization of this would be gamma times dt, and here you have tau x tensor trace over rho on the x part, plus 1 minus gamma dt of rho. That. Yes, aha, uh -huh, you, you mean that? Yes. So if I, indeed, sorry, the, maybe what you're asking is, it, it, so if I had a thermal a system that was only connected to one thermal environment described by the reset equation, then the, the um, then indeed the master equation would just be that one dissipator. Yeah. Yes? No, so when you, when you turn it into a differential equation, gamma is sort of the rate that it happens. So um, one, uh, one way of putting it is the following. Imagine that I have my qubit, and the way it's connected to my bath of qubits that it's, it, it could reset to is that every now and then one of them comes and collides with it. And when it collides, they swap states, and you now have the thermal state on your system qubit. Now, the frequency with which the collision happens sort of determines what gamma is. So... So, ga so gamma is it's it's sort of you, you turn a discrete the one of the ways of looking at a discrete process turned into a continuous is that 
If you look at a discrete process for long enough and then you average over that time, you get something that you can describe by a continuous process. So gamma really encodes the frequency of, of how, how frequently this reset happens, for instance. Now that, that is a, if I consider it as a discrete collision model. But the other way of doing it is I can consider my qubit has some complicated Hamiltonian interaction with a bath of qubits. So similar to what we discussed in equilibration. Right? And now the strength of that Hamiltonian will scale gamma. If I take one Hamiltonian and I write a reset equation and then I just multiply the Hamiltonian by a constant, then that will just multiply that gamma by a constant because it will speed up the process. Yeah. Yes? Yes, yes. So in the discrete case, I, I, I just described what you would do to cool C. But as we said at the end, in fact, there is a competing process, which is that C wants to be reset by its environment. And then we, there, there was no way to compare these two. It would just be like, where do you put this reset of C within the other resets? But now we can, because now we say that each one of them has a rate. C has a rate of reset, R and H have a rate of reset, and they are all in the same, in the same master equation here. Yeah, good indeed. Right. Any other questions? No. Um, okay. Uh, in that case, I think because it's ten twenty-seven now, we will take a break now, and we will continue at ten thirty-five. So it's exactly eight minutes from now. Check. Check. All right. Welcome back. Um, yes. So to continue. So one of the things. Um, let me talk a bit about the master equation again. So the principle behind the master equation really is, is the following. I, I have, it's somehow, it's very much related to the concept of equilibration. I have a little system and I have a large environment and I have some interaction between the system and environment. Now, I know that I can always, what is always true in quantum mechanics, first principles is I can always write D of rho SE by DT is equal to minus i h s e comma rho. This is true just by definition. But the point is that when I have a system of interest to me, what I would really prefer to see is what the rate of change of just the state of the system is. So my the thing that I really want to look at is d rho s by dt. Now, if the interaction is complicated enough and the environment is complicated enough, this might not even be possible. And a very simple way of looking at this is imagine that the system was one qubit, the environment was another qubit, and you were and your interaction was one that was doing the C naught gate. So it was it was one that would it would it was a rotation that would get you to the C naught and back, of course. It's a cyclic thing. Then you would not be able to trace out to just get D rho S by DT because the the operate well, you could get D rho S by DT as an operator working on rho, but it's not going to be a completely positive operator. And the reason you, you can think about it this way, if you look at just the state of your system under the C0 operation or a rotation that does the C0 operation, it goes from pure to mixed to pure again. And going from pure to mixed, you can have by a CPTB map, but going from mixed to pure again is, you, you're basically not conserving information. So you'll nev you're not going to be able to separate it like that. However, if your environment is large enough, and, and this is, these are now the things, you, you need a number of assumptions here. So let me write them down. So the first thing is that, Get the list as well. So you need that the correlations between system and environment. So um, okay, let, let me actually using the same notation as in the in the equilibration thing. So this is the bath, and I'm going to use B. So I lost quickly. So rather than having the bath also being a single qubit, now imagine that the bath is like one million qubits, and the interaction is so complicated that the instant your system gets entangled with this, it gets lost in the bath. So that's the first assumption that you need. And the second thing is Markovianity. Which is that the correlations do not return. Do not sort of 
Well, so they are, do not return to the system. This is a very, so I'm not putting the technical terms of this because each of the technical definitions is then a whole discussion on its own. But what the second part means is that, so again, using the example of a C0 gate, when I do the C0 operation, the system looks like it's in a maximally mixed state. So if I have two qubits, one of which starts with, so by the C0 operation, I mean, imagine that I started with um, this operation. So 0 tensor 1. Uh, sorry, 0 plus 1 over root 2, tensor 0, and then I do the C0 operation. Then I would go to 0, 0 plus 1, 1 over root 2. Okay, so that's the C0 operation. When I do this operation, my system goes from a pure to mixed state, but I know that the mixture is actually, it's not that I've lost all of the information, it's just that the information is within the correlation, well, the entanglement in this case. So if I was to do the C0 again on this, and the C0 is its own reverse, then I would go back to this, this thing, I would, the system would be back in, the, in a pure state. But now imagine a situation in which once I do this operation, these correlations are lost in the environment in such a way that then I cannot do the reverse operation because now I no longer have access to that information. That is the, the assumption of Markovianity. So whatever entanglement builds up, it is lost quickly and never returns to affect the evolution of the system at a later time. That's the second sort of assumption. And the third assumption is one we've already discussed, the bath is, is large, meaning that all of the, um, that the energy that I exchange with the bath is not actually going to change its temperature because it's so large that its heat capacity is effectively infinite. It can accept infinite energy uh, as part of the temperature. And also ideal, so it's, and by ideal, I mean it's an ideal thermal bath. It always obeys Jane's principle. So in fact, one of the ways of looking at all of these three things is to say, well, other than the, the large part, but the correlations lost, the Markovianity, and the ideal nature, they all are also um, understandable as versions of Jane's principle. What I'm basically saying is that every time my system interacts with the bath for a small amount of time, the bath instantly says, well, I'm going to continue to obey Jane's principle. So all of the information and correlations that are built up are instantly lost, and I'm always in the, in the state of maximum entropy. Now, that is, of course, a principle. Physically, in order for that to happen, you have to actually look at the form of HSE. You have to look at whether it actually has the form um, that the interactions with, within the bath are going to take away the information that you build up at the boundary quickly enough. So this is something that you actually test um, how quickly Jane's principle is obeyed, for instance. But if you do have that, then you get something that's a master equation that's just on the system. That you can just be like, let me look at the system, and on the system alone, I can see what the what the dynamics are, okay? Um, yes, indeed, and in addition, the one important thing, and a lot of people have asked questions about this, so in order to be able to sum interactions, so the argument that I've made in order to construct this equation is to say, if there are a number of interactions happening on the system at the same time, then I can write down the rate of change of the system as just happening due to the sum of the interactions. Now, this works in this case because of two things, one is, each of the dissipators is acting on a, on a um, different, if I write the system as a tensor product, cold, room, and hot, the dissipators is working, one is on the room, one is on the cold, one is on the hot. And in addition, the interaction term is of the form that is energy preserving. And that, that is why it does not, you can write it as a sum with this cold, room, and hot. So in, as an example, if I had a dissipator that was actually resetting you into a state that was coherent, for example. So I, I had some sort of physical process that was resetting, let's say, resetting the cold and the room into the maximally entangled state together. Then that process would not be able to be summed with the dissipator just on the room being thermal or the hot being thermal uh, on its own, because those interactions would be a very different kind. They would basically be non-commuting interactions. And so then the argument would have been, well, in order to write down the joint dissipator, I will have to take each of those interactions, evolve them for dt together, see what happens, and then it's basically the, the problem with non-commuting operations. I have to do them for each differential step of time. I cannot do them for a large amount of time directly because I cannot shift the operations with respect to each other. So in this case, it works, but whenever one constructs a master equation, one has to be careful that this this argument for adding the sums, uh, the interactions together is actually allowed. And there is, of course, literature and research papers on how to do this properly and consistently. Okay, let's move on. Oops. 
Um, all right. So the final thing I will say is imagine that you have an environment that satisfies these assumptions. I mean, I've not written them technically. Then you could ask, well, what is the general form of a master equation that I will get? So I've written down a particular example of a master equation. But you could say, well, as long as I am in this regime where my environment is complicated enough, always obeys Jane's principle, what is the general form of the master equation? It's always going to be of what we call the Lindblad form. And this is something you will do further in a tutorial, but I will write the Lindblad form now. And it is d rho by dt is minus i h comma rho plus, and you will have the sum of dissipated, and, and now the dissipators are in Lindblad form, which is the sum over k, a k rho, now let's not write it a k, let's write l, no. l k rho l k dagger minus half of l k dagger l k comma rho, this is the anti-commutator by the way, just in case Mutator. Yes. So this is the general form of a master equation that satisfies those principles. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what I'm saying now is that whenever you have that situation, system, large environment, and the environment is ideal in all of the senses I described then the system's evolution you can write as this form, basically. And, um, and, so, and, the, and as before, this is sort of the local part, and this is the environment part. So in the, in the context of thermodynamics, in particular, what happens is these LK, we can call them jump operators, Because if you look at this LK rho, LK dagger is really the form of an operation on the density matrix. It's a transformation of the density matrix. As a very simple example, let me give you the example of, so example, LK for a qubit is equal to um, 1, 0. Because what will, this, what will this do? So LK rho, LK dagger will be equal to 1, 0, rho, 0, 1 which is equal to just 0, rho, 0, 1, 1, the operator. And, and what you see, this, what, what has this done? It is an operator that has taken the, the density matrix element that's in 0, 0, so it's taken the population of being in the 0 state, but it's put it in the 1 state because the final state that you have is 1. So really is a jump operator. You're going from 0 to 1. And then the converse thing would be 1 to 0, for instance. So even though... The reset equation, as I've written, down, written it down there, does not look like it's of this form. Like mathematically, it looks some completely different. You can put it into this form. All you have to do is to construct jump operators. This one, L01, you have the jump operator um, one, uh, sorry, 01. And then you can have another jump operator that's just sigma z, which will just be, which corresponds to dephasing. So, Put it this way, a, a zero one is a jump operator because it changes the energy, but then you can have operators of the form, also I just write it here, this zero, zero, and one, one. And these, these, these only cor correspond to dephasing. And what I mean is, when you write down the master equation and you see what happens to the density matrix, if you write, uh, you put in such a dissipator based on zero, zero, or one, one, you see that the only effect that it has, it does not shift around the diagonal elements, the only effect that it has is to kill the off-diagonal elements. And this is something I will not prove here, but that's what happens. So yeah, so you can put the reset equation into Lindblad form, um, and every uh, equation, every master equation that satisfies those assumptions will be of Lindblad form anyway. Okay. The other interesting thing to note is that in the thermodynamics case, when you have jump operators, the okay. So there are two ways of writing the Lindbladians. One, I can put all of the rates within the L. Or I can also put in a, a gamma k on the outside and then have the L's just be normalized. But either way, it, it doesn't matter. If I put it in this form, 
So I have the else be, let's say, let's say I have a reset equation that has only 0, 1, and 1, 0 in it. But I tell you the reset equation, sorry, not the reset, the Limbladian, it came about because of a thermal bath. So I've constructed this Limbladian by, con by coupling to a thermal bath. Then what you have is that gamma of 1, 0 upon gamma of 0, 1. So this gamma of 1, 0 is the, is, let's say, the, the rate of this one, gamma of 1, 0. And this is gamma of 0, 1. So gamma 1, 0 is the rate of jumping from 0 to 1. Gamma 0, 1 is the rate of jumping from 0 to 1, um, 1 to 0. This is going to be given by the Gibbs ratio. This is going to be e to the, the rate of jumping from 0 to 1 is e to the minus yeah, beta e of the system. Okay. So this is, so, I mean, these are, these are all things that I'm, I'm now not going to full technical detail, but it's important to sort of understand where they come from. This is, this and all of the versions of this statement is referred to the, as detailed balance. And the reason for this is very simple. So you've studied the qubit swap, right? And you know that the steady state under the qubit swap is really that you just go to the thermal state of what you're swapping with. So the same thing happens if you are, if you are inducing jumps because of coupling to a thermal state, then the rate of going up versus going down is going to give you the Gibbs, is going to be the Gibbs ratio. This also Im immediately implies that when you ask, well, when will the rates become equal? It'll be when my populations of my state are the same as actually the Gibbs ratio, because then there will be, it will be balanced and the state will not change anymore. All right. Are there any questions or explanations of this part? So th this is the part of the lecture where I try to sort of hand-wavingly discuss many aspects of thermal machines without doing all of the technical details because it is complicated. Yes? Why is there an anti-commutator? This, this, this you will actually do within the lecture. In the, I mean, honestly, it's more mathematical than physical. So when you use the differential uh, evolution of a system to prove this form, which is something you do in the lecture, this part comes out straight from the channel. So you will start with the channel for a small time, and, and this is really has the form of a channel, right? You have uh, the, the usual quantum channel is, is AK rho, AK dagger, sum over K. This is a quantum channel. So then, then as a result of doing it for a differential amount of time, you will get some conditions. And then at the end, you will use the fact that every channel is normalized to find what some remainder operator is. And the form of the remainder operator is basically that. So that's how it, it comes there. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, sorry, I meant the tutorial. Yeah, not the next lecture, yeah. So in the tutorial after the class. So you will go through proving the limb form from the, sorry, from the differential equation, yeah. Any other questions? No, all right, good. So now we can continue with the thermal machine that you were discussing. Okay, so the end result of all of this is that I have now constructed a differential equation that tells me how my system will evolve. So now I want to know what happens to the system. So one of the things that I can do, and this is the, e like the easier thing to do, so I can split now the evolution of the system into two parts. One is the transient part, which is from t is equal to zero to finite t. But there's the other thing that I can look at, which is what we call the steady state. The limit t tends to infinity of rho of t. Okay. Yes. So this is something that's unique to irreversible dynamics because we know that if, if I only had a unitary evolution, so I take out the dissipators and I only have the commutator of h comma rho, then clearly there is no steady state because well, unless I am in an eigenstate. If I'm in an eigenstate of rho, then the initial state is the state at all times, which is the steady state. But if I'm not in an eigenstate of rho, then I expect some evolution to happen, and then I will, if it's Hamiltonian in unitary dynamics, it will be cyclic or, to some extent. But because I have the dissipator, it's possible that I actually end up in a state that doesn't change. I mean, it, already we saw this with the reset equation. If I have just the reset master equation, I end up in the thermal state. So, okay, so the steady state, therefore, is now the definition is very simple. Limit t tends to infinity of rho of t. How do I calculate this? So mathematically, I can calculate this by going, well, let me solve d rho by dt equals to zero. 
because d rho infinity by dt, once I'm in the steady state, by definition, my state should not be changing. So at that point, I should get 0. So I just I simply solve for that being 0. So I say minus i h int comma rho infinity plus the sum over x dx of rho infinity. That's all equal to 0. And that gives me rho infinity. So it's just a linear equation. Okay. Now. A few things to say. In general, this is not unique. I mean, if I look at this as just a linear system e of equations, your solution space may not be a single, uh, it may not be of rank 1. It may be of rank n, where you, know, n, you have a basis of n states, and you can take a linear combination of any of them, and you still have uh, a solution. Um, so in general, this is not unique. But in some cases, it is. So for us, it is. So it is unique. It is unique for the three qubit fridge. For okay. So, um, so imagine that we did this for the case of the fridge. Uh, one of the things you can ask is, uh, well, what are the different ways of, of actually solving this equation, such an equation if you have it. And um, there is, in thermodynamics, there is one particularly very neat manner of doing it. And the manner sort of derives from the fact that what you have, if you describe this as something with or without the interaction, you can describe first the master equation without the interaction. What is the master equation without the interaction? Well, you just have the three dissipators that act on three components of the system and they t take it to the thermal states of all of the systems. So without the interaction, we know what the steady state is. You just are in a product of thermal states. Thermal state on cold, thermal state on room, thermal state on hot. Okay. So you, what you can do is you can say, well, my basis, my main state here is, I'm just going to call this um, like rho 0 is tau cold, tensor tau room, tensor tau hot. This is before h int is switched on. OK? So then one easy thing to do is to say, well, OK, now I'm going to take this basic state here, and then I'm going to put it in the master equation and the full master equation. So I know that if I put this equation into the dissipators, I'm going to get 0. Because any of the dissipators acting on this is just going to give you 0. You're already in the state that's given that the dissipator wants to take you to. So you can put this into the into that equation, and you can ask, well, what sort of states do I get out from that? So I just go, what is d rho naught by dt? And I'm going to get a list of operators. Some operators are going to be 0. Some operators are going to be rho naught. And then I'm going to get some other operators. And in particular, if I put this equation, this one here, into the commutator of h int with rho, I'm going to get the operator y c r h. Okay, and now what is y c r h? What I do is I I use this basis of state, so zero, one zero, one zero one, and in this basis I make the Pauli matrices. Okay, so y so now y c r h is going to be zero one zero one zero one with an i minus i one zero one zero one zero. For example, and then I can also have x c r h, um, z c r h, and so on. I can also define um, reduced versions of this, so I can define, let's say, so z c r h is equal to the usual, so zero one zero one zero one minus one zero one zero one zero. Um, I may or may not get a minus sign globally in this, but this is not important for the argument. But then I can also Define reduced versions of this. So, um, sorry, this is this is not correct. The z in that basis is diagonal. One zero one, one zero one. So z is diagonal between the two states. Y is of course the off-diagonal elements. And then I can define z. Let's say c h, which is basically trace of z c r h over r. And then I will get. Um, so if I take out r. Then I have so 0, 0, 0, 0 on CH minus 1, 1, 1, 1 on CH. 
So I can do this and I can define a lot of um, sort of deriv derived operators from this. So I have, I start with y, I have x and z, and then from the z I can have reduced z. Note that I cannot have a reduced y, because if I try to trace any, any of the systems in y, I will just get zero. They're all off-diagonal elements in that operator. Okay, yes? So what I'm gonna do is, if I, ask, I ask the question, what happens if I put the com this, this state tau into the commutator h int? So I, I calculate, so this is basically, so h int comma tau rho tensor tau c, to, uh, so c r tau hot is going to be proportional to y c r h, basically. This is a claim that I'm making, and um, is it very simple to see? Yes, so the way you see this is h int, so remember h int is of the form, so h int is of the form one, 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 uh, zero, one, one, zero, one, 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 and tau is of the form, so this is h int, and tau, the global tau, c r h, is of the form just diagonal elements, and zero is off diagonal, okay? So when I take the commutator, if I multiply this by this, these, the first three and the last three elements will give me something, but that on the, on the negative of the thing, the flip thing will also be the same, they will just vanish. So the only thing that remains is, is within this, this subspace, and it will give me something that is proportional to y. This is, this is also related to the fact that if you take the Pauli, so you can think of tau, okay, put it this way, this tau operator in that subspace, because it's entirely diagonal, you can write it as a combination of identity and z Pauli matrices. Because every, every matrix you can write identity and z for the diagonals, x and y for the off diagonals. So if you take the commutator of something which is identity and z, with this, which is x, you're going to get y, because the z part with x is going to give you y. So that's why you get y. Okay. The anti-commutator? Ah, so what I was, I was just saying, aha, uh -huh, maybe I should have slowed down. So what I'm going to, what I was doing was, I was taking my initial state, I was putting it through the master equation and seeing all of the operators I got. So if I put this through the dissipator, this is from the dissipator. I would just get zero, because if I put tau in that dissipator, you can see any of the taus I put in any of the dissipators, I'm going to get zero. If I put it within, um, well, actually, I'm not gonna get rho naught from anywhere. I'm just gonna get zero from the dissipator and I'm gonna get y from this term, yeah. Okay, yes, continue. Exactly, yes, yes, indeed. So d rho dt is a sum of such operators, yeah, indeed. Okay, now, uh, and, and so, so you might think of why, why am I doing this? So this is, um, at the moment, it's kind of arbitrary. I've just taken an initial state, I've put it in d rho by dt, I've gotten a list of operators. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just continue building on this list of operators. So I started only with the tensor product of taus, and now in addition to that, I have this y. And then I can take tau and y, I can put it back in the dissipator. I already know what happens if I put tau into the, sorry, into the master equation. I can say, well, what happens if I put y in the master equation? And that is going to give me oh, a new board for starters, because I'm running out of space. Uh, I'm not going to raise the top of that. Uh, oh, let me keep that for the engine at the end. I'm in 10. Um, yes. Okay. So what is going to happen as, as a result of this process? So I, I start with, so let me describe the process. I start with tau C tensor, tau rho tensor, tau hot, and then I put it through d rho by dt, 
and I get a set of operators. And we've concluded that the set of operators is once again the same thing, tau tensor tau tensor tau. And then the next one that I got out of it is y c r h. Then I can do this again. I can put this set, both of these individually, through this, and I will get another set of operators, and so on and so forth. And the point is that because the, um, the mass equation here, it acts very particularly, right? H int acts only within a very small subspace, and the dissipators act only on cold room and hot. This process is, is eventually going to end. It's going to give me a set of operators, and then every time I put one of the set of operators within the master equation, I will just get another one in the set. And so I can describe the set loosely for you. So it, it just goes tau tensor tau tensor tau is one of the set, R C H. Then there's Y C R H. Then there's Z C R H. And then in addition, there is Z C R, Z C H, Z. Z um, R H, and finally Z C, Z R, and Z H. And it turns out, in fact, that if you put any one of these in, you're going to get at the end one of the others. Okay. And the the reason for this sort of technique, um, so it's it's twofold. So if you imagine solving this as a linear equation, what would you think of? Well. You could say, I can just write this. This is now a system of linear equations, right? My density matrix rho is a density matrix of an eight qubit state, so it has 64 elements. And so I'm just going to have 64 linear equations that will then, if I want to solve this for d rho by dt, d rho infinity by dt is equal to zero, I'm just solving for 64 equations there. But the point is, we also go, well, actually, surely I do not need 64 equations. Because the fact that I have a dissipator and that H int works only in this small subspace means that most of my elements, in fact, are going to end up being zero in the steady state. Because the dissipators, remember, they just take all of the off-diagonal elements to zero. So you expect there to be less elements. And because of that, you can say, well, a more elegant way of doing this would be, let me plug in what my initial state would be before I turn on the interaction, and then see what my initial state can turn into. And you see, ah, OK, it turns into a set of these operators. So these are the only operators that can actually appear in rho infinity. Because as a result of the master equation, this can only go into something of this set. So this set cannot go outside. So then you can say, actually, let me write my rho infinity as equal to the sum over, um, over let's say, n, cn times um, operator, let's say, call it mn, where mn, so mn is within, is a set of allowed operators somehow. The operators that you know you could have gotten to as a result of that, of that um, evolution. And so this is much more elegant because you see the number of operators there is what is the a, four by six, seven, it's about 10 or 11 or so. I think there might even be less. I'm not sure. Okay. No, there cannot be less. That has to be that, but yeah, indeed. Um, and so another conclusion that we can make out of this is that, in fact, rho infinity is of the following form. So you have the diagonal elements. And you will have only one of diagonal elements. Because if you look at every one of these operators right, that I've written, you see that the only one that's of diagonal is y, CRH. Because even z, so incidentally, when I said zch is trace over r of that, in fact, if I, I can still write it as a three qubit operator by just tensoring the identity of what I traced out. So that's important. So each one of these is, so I can now say tensor identity on H. This is tensor identity on room, and so on and so forth. So they're all three qubit operators still. It's just tensor identity with the ones that are not there. Now, every one of them, with the exception of Y, is diagonal, which means that if I now use this fact that my row infinity is the sum of these operators, it means that the only off-diagonal element is the one corresponding to y. So it's this. So it's one pair of off-diagonal elements here, and this is the element corresponding to one zero one zero one zero, and of course this is zero one zero one zero one. So in fact, my steady state of the system is is very simple. It just has an off-diagonal element corresponding to the interaction term, and everything else is zero. This is the advantage of looking at the steady state. Because the transient analysis, I said, well, let's see what happens from t is equal to 0 to a finite t. 
that can be very complicated because if I start with a state at t is equal to zero that's very, for example, very coherent, then I could have all sorts of elements here that are non-zero. So the advantage of going to the steady state is what you see is then the long time behavior. You, you go, well, after long enough time, I know that my system will have the properties that are described essentially by the steady state. So this is the same thing as like turning on an engine and well, waiting with an engine is basically half a second until you hear all the sounds corresponding to it turning on and then it's like, okay, now I'm in its, it's in its steady state of operation. Okay. Are there any questions? No, all right, so I have nine minutes left. So there are a number of um, comments to make here. So the, the first comment is that because of this off diagonal element, you know that the state, so the steady state, oh, let's just say rho infinity, I don't have to write it. Rho infinity is correlated. Because remember, this off diagonal element is in, is in a basis where you see 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, which means that if I try to trace out any of these systems, this will vanish immediately. It's 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 a element that belongs only on the entire joint system. If I look at the reduced marginal of two versus the other three, or one versus the other two, I will instantly not see this element. So the steady state is correlated, and it can, it may be, even entangled. Okay, and this is now immediately interesting to us because this is now something that's quantum. I have I've created a um, a quantum thermal machine with a master equation with very simple resources, because my resources, remember, they have, they have they obey Jane's principle, they're thermal baths, they're diagonal, they have no coherence in them. So I just have a simple interaction, energy-preserving interaction Hamiltonian, and three thermal baths, and with that I've created a correlation that could be entangled. And how do I check whether it's entangled? Well, this is now a question of how large this element is with respect to the diagonal elements. So this goes into the uh, into the field of entanglement witnesses to, to check whether a state is entangled or not, you have to actually do some, you can, there are a number of tests that you can do depending on what's the dimension of the state, etc. So I'm not going to go into that, but it is to say there is a paper that has shown that there are regimes of operation for this fridge, so I can choose the, all of the gammas and the constants in such a way that the steady state is in fact an entangled state. And so this opens, opens up the field of the thermal generation of entanglement. And this is going to be another question that you will do in the tutorial for actually something that is even simpler. So in the tutorial, you will do a fridge that actually has just two qubits of the same energy, each connected to a bath, and interacting with the swap Hamiltonian and to see whether it's entangled or not. So yeah, so that is that opens up the thermal generation of entanglement. Um, another comment to make here is that, so what I described here is an, a method of how to get to rho infinity. The converse, however, if somebody gives you a state and asks you, is it a steady state or not, that is very trivial, because then you just plug it into the Limbladian and you check whether the answer you get is zero or not. So to check whether something is a steady state is very simple. To find what the steady state is when you don't know it in the beginning, that is the one that you have to either use this method or, in the worst case scenario, just calculate it by brute force by just taking all of the linear equations that you will get. OK, so I know that I will have to go to tomorrow's lecture because we would like to complete this for the regimes of cooling. Um, what I'm going to state at the end is, OK, so what, what would you expect this state to look like? Now, so the question now is, so what is the most important question for us, because we are constructing a fridge that is cooling uh, the cold qubit, is what is trace over R and H of rho infinity, which is basically equal to, let's say, rho, I can call this rho infinity on, on C, basically. Well, I would like to use two subscripts, but well, let's use two subscripts anyway. Rho C infinity. Because the point, the whole point of constructing all of this, this big thing was that I wanted to cool qubit C. So I want to see in the steady state that qubit C actually ends up in a temperature that is less than beta C. And um, what we find is the following. So when am I going to have time? 
final thing to say in this lecture before I discuss the results in the next. And so this I'm going to state without the proof, but it's that rho infinity is actually equal to tau C tensor tau room tensor tau hot plus what I'm going to call the bias times some operator here. And this operator is Traceless. Okay. Well, this operator has to be traceless because once I write rho infinity as a trace one operator plus something else, well, clearly the other thing has to be traceless, otherwise we would violate it. Now, and this operator, as you can expect, is some linear combination of all of that set of operators that I wrote down there with the y, the z, all of etc. But the important part of this is, is what is this bias? This bias is actually equal to or proportional to um, so this, I'm, I'm using the same notation as in the papers, because it's so R C R R H minus R uh, R bar C R R H little R bar, and these so R X and R bar X is population of ground state. X and population of excited state of X of X and this is both the initial populations. Okay, so another way of writing this would be in the initial state this is P zero one zero minus P one zero one on C, R, and H. Okay. All right. So the end result is your steady state deviates from the thermal state by some operator. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of constants here that depend on the gammas that I put in, as well as the Gs. The H in, remember, has a G as a rate associated with it. But it is also, very crucially, proportional to a bias and the bias is basically the difference in population that you start off with in that subspace where essentially all of the refrigeration is happening. So the, the 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 subspace. And what we're going to do in the next lecture is going to look, we're going to actually use, we know what these values are, or at least we know what the Gibbs ratio between these are. We can check whether this is greater or 0 or this is less than 0 just by looking at the temperatures beta R, beta C, beta E, uh, beta H, and E, R, E, C, E, H. And we see essentially that when we have that the condition that this is positive or negative is actually the same as the condition that we started off with to construct a virtual temperature that was colder than beta C or less than beta C. So that basically gives us whether we will be successful in making a refrigerator or not. And the other thing that we will do in the lecture is to then calculate the efficiency of this refrigerator and to show based on this equation and the answer we get to the first part when it is a refrigerator to show that in fact the maximum efficiency is given by the Carnot efficiency that you have been used to studying um, in classical thermodynamics if you did classical refrigerators and engines. We will also discuss some um, generalizations to thermal machines. So not just the fridge, but what would you do if you constructed an engine and some other types of generalizing the master equation and the interactions um, that we have left. All right, I will end here. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.